Cyber sales is hard. But don't let the difficulty of doing it get in way of your good judgment. So what is the right way to follow up with a CISO? You're listening to Defense in Depth. Welcome to Defense in Depth. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. And joining me for this very episode is the one, the only Jeff Belknap. He is the CISO of LinkedIn. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. David, thanks for inviting me back. I'm always happy to be here. I'm always happy to have you on. And our sponsor for today's episode, a new sponsor, we've had him, I think, just one or two episodes prior, but it is Soul Cyber. Bring simplicity and affordability to your cybersecurity. Ah, affordability. Not many companies pitch that element of cybersecurity, which rings true with everyone. Anyways, more from Soul Cyber, spelled S O L C Y B E R, later in the show. Now, today's topic came up from Jason Chan, who used to run security over at Netflix. He posted an image from an email that just said, Hi, Jason, I'm following up on the previous email, to which Jason added the caption, Please don't. There was an insane response, over 1,900 reactions and 360 comments. Salespeople feel compelled to keep prodding, and security professionals don't like to be prodded. I think, and I've said this before, I think the reason this happens is the the way salespeople are measured and the pressure they're given, and they it just they feel compelled that they have to do this, and it's a tough job. Jeff? It is a very tough job. And I feel a lot of respect and appreciation for people in the sales industry. Having worked at several startups, like real startups, where we were starting from nothing and supported the sales teams, I in, like I have worked directly with those folks. And I've been a sales engineer. I've supported sales teams directly early in my career. It is probably a harder job than working in security, if if not equally hard. But the reality is the CISO role it has got to be one of the top five roles that are targeted by salespeople or business development reps or account development reps. I would go to top one, in fact. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a hard time imagining who else is getting more cold reach out and getting targeted for more sales. And it just it, it sets up the situation where it's very challenging. So I think it, today would be a great conversation to have about what do we do about that? And I, I'm going to re- reassert, we were just talking about this before we all went on microphone. The goal here is to be as positive as possible. We don't want a, a litany of don't do this, don't do that, stop harassing us, don't do that. And, and honestly, the whole CISO series brand started because there was far too much of that and it wasn't helping anybody. And so our goal is to help. And the person who's going to help us on this journey is the CISO over at Michigan Medicine, Jack Kufal. Jack, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for being here. This is going to be fun. What is everyone complaining about? Jim Wellington of Just Me said, quote, you as a company or CXO blowing us off if we have composed a thoughtful response is pure arrogance. Simply respond, you aren't interested. I can personally vouch I won't bother you again in that regard. Stephanie Mulder, TMC Transportation says, quote, it takes a lot of courage to cold call people. Instead of treating us like something you stepped in, just give us the courtesy of saying you are not interested. You are never too big to be nice to people. Kind of like that last comment there. And Michael Donnelly of Orca Security said, reps are in a no-win situation. They're either pissing a prospect off or not doing enough in the eyes of some. So you just, you hear a lot of frustration in those comments. And one thing that I didn't see in the comments is what a lot of people don't understand is you're not the only one. If you were the only one, it wouldn't be the problem. The problem is it's a litany. And that's, I think, what pushes a lot of CISOs over the edge. Yes, Jeff? Yeah. I mean, look, let's let's level set for a second. And I'm curious to hear if Jack is running in the same situation, but I'm, I'm just going to throw it out there. My email is worthless to me. And I don't mean that in the sense of you emailing me is a bad idea. I mean, I get so much inbound email that I can't use my email most of the time in a, in a reasonable way. I literally have to filter off all external email to a separate inbox and then manage the things I want to get in my main inbox through an allow list. And that is not a great way to use my email. And it is largely because I get so much cold outreach. 
So what I would really like to do is I would love to respond to everybody and do a quick little, hey, hey, thanks. I'm, I'm not interested. I'm not looking for this right now. But if I did that, I would, I would literally, and I'm not being hyperbolic here, I would write about 100 emails a day. And, I, and that's not a reasonable thing for me to do. I'll say, and this is somewhat self-serving, it is much easier for me to do this on LinkedIn because on LinkedIn, there's an option for me to say, no thanks, or just click a button that says I'm, I'm declining interest. And that's more workable for me, but I get 30 of those a day. So I completely understand, as Michael Donnelly has pointed out, that reps are in a no-win situation. They are under incredible pressure from their, their leadership to make contacts and drum up and build new business. And people like Jack and I, we do our jobs, but also deal with the fact that we have an incredible amount of cold outreach coming to us. And I'll tell you the really hard thing for me, and then I'll turn it over to Jack here, is I probably want to hear from some of these companies, but it is very difficult for me to do that based on the volume of outreach that I get to make a decision about which one of these new things am I going to read that, that I need to contact. So I do think we need to talk about new ways to reach out to people because email is definitely not working anymore. I don't know, Jack, what do you think? Does any of that resonate with you? Yeah, I agree with that. I come from sort of the school of thought that email is quite evil uh, and that we just can't seem to get rid of it. And I agree. The The volume is insane. And if you do take on the goal of managing your inbox, which quite honestly, a lot of my peers have just given up. They just declare email bankruptcy and just dump tens of thousands of messages at the end of the quarter without ever touching them. If you do manage that inbox, one of those internal versus external sales versus non-sales, those filters, they don't even hit the radar. And I also agree with you, though, some of my strongest partners in building a cybersecurity program have been our vendors and our sales engineers and our sales reps. So there's just missed opportunity time and time again, because the cold call mechanism is just so easy, not necessarily just to ignore, but to be indifferent towards that you can't use it as a sorting mechanism to figure out what you could possibly be interested in, or even what a company does, and if that's a market that you're looking for. And I think one of the, and this is going to come up also later, but I get this question all the time. There's this theory that there's some magical combination of words to put in a subject or in an email that gets a CISO to open the email and respond. And I think what you're both saying is, we just have to be thinking about this a completely different way because there is no answer to that question. What do you guys think? I agree. I don't know if it's a completely different way. Certainly sales was occurring before email, before cybersecurity, successful mm -hmm. sales. So it could be re-examining successful sales techniques, which probably all go back to what I often refer to as what is that network of networks, right? Some of the most powerful sales conversations I've ever had with a vendor have come at the invitation of a respected peer or colleague, not necessarily a cold call. And knowing who has the best kitchen knives doesn't come off an infomercial. It comes from somebody who also has those good kitchen knives. So building that network of networks, I think, is critical to how we build those relationships between vendor and consumer. Yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll respond to this and say, I think the volume is so high, I really don't get a chance to do anything but skim these things. And I'll, and I'll give you an example. It is about 1030 in the morning, we're recording this podcast. And if I look at my inbox, that's external emails, I already have 48 new emails that I haven't read yet. They're all external that are almost exclusively from vendors. And there's no reasonable chance for me to actually read through those. And it's only 1030 in the morning, I'm going to get more of those. I think my take is there's no magical combination of those emails. It's going to have to be email plus some soft expectation that I should be looking for that. How do I start? So one of the things that I've heard again and again is that people buy from people and that process of cybersecurity is built on trust and CISOs also need trust in their vendor relationships. I hear the comment of always wanting a partner and here are some quotes on just this topic. Jillian Confus of Maple Street said, quote, persistence is what pays off and building trust. Neil Saltman of Sotero said, warm intros is the key. Number one way CISOs validate solutions is by talking to their peers. Now that one we hear all the time. And Ben Griffith of Two Fin said, quote, an email sent without some sort of context of a previous phone call, conversation with a peer, known business need, et cetera, should never 
be sent. That's an interesting end to that. What do you think of that? Like, if you are sending an email that doesn't have a connection to something else, never send it. What do you think about that, Jack? Nah, I don't agree with that. Okay. I, I, I think persistence and some of the other references and where those connections sort of what is the multi-channel communication that you're leveraging. But to say an email should never be sent. But I, I do think it, with credit to, to Ben, the idea that it should then be particularly customized or particularly appropriate. You know, there aren't five uniform magic words that are going to make a CISO open a mail. But understanding where that personal connection might be or a toehold in understanding the problems that that CISO, that sector, that industry may have is probably enough to have that cold email that's, that has no other connection to be read. If it is just a form email that could be sent either to my industry being healthcare, the same one they sent to finance, the same one they sent to manufacturing, that comes through pretty clear. And it also comes through that that is not a cold email. That's a, that's a frozen email. And frozen emails probably should <laughs> never be sent. I think we're getting maybe a, we're probably getting a little too good at pattern recognition and people like Jack and I can recognize a form email or a template email a thousand yards away. I really feel like Neil is onto something here, but I want to highlight like warm intros is, is the key. I almost always, when there's a warm intro, it's because someone that knows me, whether it be Jack or somebody else, is like, oh, you know who'd need this? Jeff needs this. I'm going to make this introduction. It, it is almost never, I will introduce you to this person and I have no idea whether they need your product, right? They, they know me, right. they know what I'm doing going on. And that's why it works. But warm intros can't be the only thing, right? Like, we have to be realistic. Like nobody can build a business just hoping to build warm intros. And that's why like, I think warm intros works. I think getting yourself out there so that there is the ability for me to contact you and know that you exist in some way that's not email is good. I think, again, LinkedIn messages work really well for me and some of my peers. Although I think the problem is a lot of business development reps sometimes treat LinkedIn messages like form emails. And I think, honestly, if we just boil it down, that is where this all fails. When it's a form email that's written and there's no idea of who you are and what your business is and what you need, it, it just doesn't work. It just, it just creates that animosity. But if you get the idea that this is something I really need, and not just because you could imagine I need it, that is, that is when that connection works. And I think what we really need to do is flip the BDR industry on its head and like, how do we build those warm relationships? How do we build those connections? How do we make more CISOs available to get pitches? And whether, I don't know if it's like, I just need to make an hour on Fridays available for people to give speed pitches or something. But like, we have to break the cycle of this. You know, Alan Alford did that. What was, he, how did he turn out on that? So I don't know if it, well, how he's doing it now, but he once a year put a post out saying, I'm setting aside an hour or two hours every week to listen to pitches. Or I think it was even more, maybe three hours or so. And he had like three things. He goes, go ahead and pitch me. And this is how exactly I want the pitch. And by the way, when he said this, every salesperson was like, oh my God, I wish every CISO did explain how they wanted to be pitched to. And it was like, tell me like, what is it you do? How you differentiated? And I can't remember the third one, but it was very quick. And you, things you could put in three bullet points and it'd be very quick and easy for him to scan and know and also listen. Because one of the things he said that I think is really, really critical is that if CISOs only get recommendations from other CISOs, what happens is you get an echo chamber and it's very hard for a new player to come into the market. And so what he said, he goes, you know, part of my job as a CISO is just to know what's out there and to be educated. And he gets a lot of education from doing this process. So he thought it was critical for his own knowledge and edification as well. I feel like this is something I should do or, or more of us should do is set aside time to do this and, the, and open it up. I think, I think Alan's onto something. I don't know, Jack, what, what do you think? Have you ever done something like this? I, I've done creative calendar blocking where I've said, oh, hey, this is how I'm going to use this time. And if I'm passing forward these vendors to be scheduled at this time, this time, and this time, they sort of get time boxed. So this takes it to the next evolution of actually telegraphing to vendors that Shark Take style that there's an opportunity here, but it's got to follow our rules. So I think being transparent and negotiating basically with your vendors or your potential vendors about how you want to be engaged, it's got to be half the battle for a vendor. And I will also throw out, we've had Hadas Kasorla on the show, who's the CISO over at M1. When she does set up a meeting, she sends out a letter saying, 
this is how we want you to engage with us and explains like, there's a reason we're talking to you and just get to the product at hand. We do not want to be introduced to the whole team. We do not want a backstory. We want to know about the product. And I think that's another critical thing, a job that the, on the, the practitioner side, they can do explain clearly when the meeting happens, how they want to be engaged with. And again, vendors would love that. But I think another thing that vendors can really bring to that table is, even though in a CISO community or even a, a subsector of like a manufacturing CISO community, and they're, they're a dime a dozen, they're all over the place. One thing that does bridge us together is vendors have more lateral access to people like us and can help contextualize our different business needs and our problems in ways that we haven't thought about it before. Good point. So I often look at vendors as that matchmaker right, to be able to say, well, the way you're approaching this is where healthcare system A was two years ago. And they they used one of our products. They also used this product, this product, and this product. So another way to navigate, and that's, there's never too much of that, that sort of, that sort of collaboration. And it doesn't have to come from just colleagues. In fact, the most powerful connections are coming when they're brokered by vendors. What I was going to mention similar to that is however you get that first meeting, is one of the first barriers, but it's not the only barrier. So it's also a question of what do you do? What happens when the dog catches the car, right? And right. so, okay, what happens when you get that meeting? And I'm far more inclined to join a meeting with two other CISOs that I know than I am to take an individual call with a vendor because the conversation and the contextualization there is critical. And I think that's good for us and good for the vendors to get that type of interaction, sort of a, a force multiplier. And I will close the segment out with a plug for our new show, Capture the CISO. What you just described there, Jack, is exactly the reason we created that show. Season two to be in development. In the mid-market, complexity seems to be a challenge for organizations who often don't really know how much security they actually need. This is why Sol Cyber provides a solution called Foundational Coverage, as CEO Scott McCready explains. Foundational Coverage allows you to get a really robust security program stood up in 30 days in a very easy and cost-effective manner. And because of that, you can pivot that into cyber insurance and get pre-approved on your cyber insurance policy while at the same time getting up to a 30% discount on that same policy. And so we help solve two different problems, which is 30% of policies are getting knocked back, getting rejected, and policy increases are 50% or more for most organizations. And so um, we're trying to help solve those two problems as well by using Soul Cyber. Their mission, he says, is to solve a big problem by bringing it down to a manageable scale. There's dozens of different service acronyms and the combination of sorting through those two to get a good security program is incredibly difficult, time consuming, and relatively financially painful. So we try to solve that by bringing something that we know works, and that is the minimal effective amount of security you need to have a very resilient operation that can actually withstand a variety of different types of attacks. For more information, visit solcyber.com. That's S-O-L-C-Y-B-E-R.com. What aspects haven't been considered? Thomas Fries of QBS Research said, quote, I would assert that how best to follow up on cold calls completely misses the point. Most of the challenge for sellers today is creating compelling reasons for potential buyers to want to engage with you the first time, rather than racking your brain to figure out how to recover from ineffective outreach tactics. Very good point. Leif Eric Friedheim of Curry's PLC said, quote, sales in this day and age should be more about making oneself visible and attractive and less about pushing oneself onto potential customers, less direct and more indirect. Now, Jeff and Jack, I don't know if you know, Andy Ellis has this very well-known vendor rejection letter. It's a, he's got it out open as a blog post. He, he sends it out automatically when he's rejecting vendors. And the bottom line of why he's rejecting, he just says, if you want me to know about your product, be awesome. I'll hear about it. Jeff, you're nodding your head back and forth. You don't quite agree. I've seen Andy's thing, and I think it's great. I think the challenge, and, and honestly, the, the challenge for me as I'm going through this episode and I'm trying to think of ways to be informative and helpful for our sales partners is 
it, so it's it's very easy, and I immediately personally and professionally identify with Andy's intent here of be awesome, I'll hear about you. Well, I'm not going to hear about you if some other CISO or security person doesn't respond to your cold email. I'm not going to hear about you if you don't get the attention of some critical mass of people, right? So it, it's sort of like chicken and the egg. Like you have to do cold emails and cold phone calls and cold voicemails or whatever, because at some point you have to get somebody that's going to talk on your behalf and advocate to the CISO or security community. And that doesn't happen if you just sit on your hands and try to make, you, you can make the world's most awesome product. And maybe I'll date myself. Beta was better than VCR. People didn't just gravitate towards beta. I think I just lost all of the listeners, but I'm with you. V, v, it's actually not beta versus VCR. VCR with the category VHS. Beta sorry, VHS. Thank you. Yeah, but but the point is, like, you can't just be awesome. You have to also take your destiny into your hands and and get out there and and sell your narrative and and communicate your value. So I think what we really have to do is maybe get inspired by what Alan's doing. I also think CISO series adds a lot of value. Like even the bumpers here, like we're, we're letting vendors talk about the, the value they add. There just has to be more and more new ways to communicate the value that you as a vendor offer without it just being an email to me. So I think really that that is over with. That's the email at this point is the follow up. If we've had a good engagement someplace, you can send me an email. I'll probably reply to it. If I've never heard from you, an email is not the way to build that new relationship for me, for a certain class of buyers. Right. Yeah. And also everyone's different, Jack. Yeah. I, I would, you know, and I, I, I try to look at myself saying, Hey, I'm just an average CISO. I don't know. But if it's only an email, like Jeff was talking about, it just doesn't resonate. It doesn't matter what that email is. I mean, I, I joke, you know, I work for an institution where it is verboten to take any sort of sales tchotchkes or pens, but Oh, do you, you like, I, cause I know that others have like a $50 maximum or something like you can't even take a pen. Can't even take a pen. I wow. think we used to have a $5 limit. And now quite honestly though, it's also don't tempt fate. I, I, it's, it's how do you set an example and so forth. So the enticement of a steak dinner or the enticement of a, a really good Nerf gun. I get it. You're trying to be creative with a tchotchke, but it's also telling me you don't know who you're selling to. So how you get past that. Have you received things and had to send them back or just give them away? We not uh, because I'm in a position where it's not just the CISOs that are being assertively marketed towards. It's the whole CISO staff, right? So I have, a, I have risk associates or cyber operative associates or even project managers that get these things. I, I have the director of my program office, which is a non-technical role, got a video game set up the other day in the mail from a vendor cold sort of cold call good lord it's one of those things where not only do we say hey we shouldn't accept these we talk about not accepting these but we typically will also call the vendor and say look i don't want you to waste your money on us you shouldn't send us these things but more importantly most universities are probably in the same boat so there's that sort of aspect to it about tactics that just don't work i don't know about leaf's comment about less direct and more indirect I go back to this idea that Jeff was talking about if it's only an email and email is really a secondary protocol. But if you're at the conferences I'm going to, if you're in the media streams I'm paying attention to, if you are being used by peers, that multi-vector sort of engagement is really the only reason why different brand names and different products are even recognizable. But I also want to point out that to a point you had made earlier, you don't want to get into this echo chamber and only use what other CISOs are using. And that comes to idea about how especially smaller companies market themselves. We try to do a vendor portfolio that is not just all the big security brand names. We use a lot of big security brand names. We use a big part of their catalog, but we also reserve certain portions for those innovative companies, if for no other reason, to be engaged on wherever the market is, but hopefully also give our staff who are implementing these technologies the exposure and the variety. So some of the things that are real market differentiators for smaller security organizations are things they're not even talking to us about. Here's how we can engage your staff with a different type of variety than what you're getting from maybe one of the big box sort of security shops. And that variety is an important talent engagement strategy for us. And talent retention is not just about compensation. It's about all these different factors. And I think vendor involvement is key to that. Who has a solution? Here's a good quote from Tiana S. of AWS. Stay with me, it's a long one. Tiana says, quote, 
There is no clear guideline on how to reach out to people, and many who start in sales will begin their journeys generating conversations with prospects and customers. It is a trial and error for most of the in this field. Sometimes we have to let people learn what would work best. So instead of posting a disliked email, why not email them back with some thoughtful and valuable experience that you have had with a salesperson so they can better understand what you value and how to approach their future prospects. I'm a strong believer in sharing knowledge and instead of something being a negative experience, turning to something positive for both sides. Now, I will echo something that Mike Johnson said. He put up a post entitled The, the Post That Wasn't where he did get a negative response from a vendor. And instead of posting and ranting and complaining about it, he said, wait a second. He mentioned it on, on a Slack group. And someone said, oh, I, I know the marketer over there or the head of sales over there. They'd like to know that this was going on. So we reached out to that person's boss first to just explain and get the situation worked out rather than making it a public nuisance. And I thought that was kind of a good way. And it wasn't a design like they were doing this awful fire them, but it's more like, hey, do you know this is going on? This needs to be retrained. Jeff, what do you think about that tactic? I have thoughts all over the place on this. I think, well, first of all, I remember that conversation in the Slack group with Mike about that. And there were a bunch of us that were on all sides of the issue. I generally think the number one thing we need to avoid as, as security professionals is, and I'm guilty of, of sort of falling into this trap, is venting publicly or overly venting publicly. Because look, your job is hard. Also, I said naming names. I get really annoyed when people start naming yeah, names. Yeah, uh, well, I'll it's say, cruel. I think it's okay to name names when it's especially egregious. And I'll, I'll say there have been cold outreaches that I've gotten that have been like, you're breached. And then you go into the email, it's like, wouldn't that be a terrible email to reach? And I'm like, get, don't ever send an email again. Like this is, there's somebody in my role to send an email like that. It's just unreasonable to do these gimmicks, right? But look, if you're sending an email, I think what is very fair and, and with the, the benefit of some time and distance from whatever the emotion is that that email made you feel, that is probably unrelated to the person that, you, that sent the email and probably more related to whatever's going on in your day. But with the benefit of emotional distance from that email, I think it is actually really useful to post the email. I don't think it's helpful to post the company or the name of the person who sent it because you're you're not trying to make them feel I, I'm yeah and I'm fine with it and I, I've done things like that before too yeah. but yeah don't expose the company or the post, yeah but post the email and then give a little comment of like I thought this was good or I thought this part was good but this didn't this didn't resonate with me here's what we could do better because I think to Tiana's point I think I think it, it's exactly right it is helpful to build a broad knowledge of where this kind of approach landed or didn't land I don't I think it's more helpful to do that in a broad place like LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever you're going to do it because more people can learn from that and it's accessible to more people on a broad platform like that as long as your intent and you are very careful that you are not excoriating the person who sent it because frankly, they probably didn't write it. It's probably a template that they were assigned to send out, but it is, I think that's more helpful than just a direct reply to the sender that's only going to help that one person. All right, Jack, I'm going to let you close this out. And also just the other thing comment that Tiana said, he said, look, this is trial and error. You're not going to get it all right at the first time, which I was like, that's one of the big things I always say also, but producing me media, allow yourself to make mistakes. Don't beat yourself up too much. Jack? This is what Tiana's talking to. I, I'm, I'm with, I'm with her there for like two thirds of this quote. There are no clear guidelines. It is a trial and error. And the whole tenet behind sharing knowledge a lot of times our first interaction with a vendor is, is, is aggressive, is a, I've got 30 seconds of your attention, maybe, probably less, 15 seconds of your attention through an email, through a LinkedIn chat, and I need to tell you about the product and I need to tell you what it does, but that's not really ever going to be useful information. Something that, and it could be a Midwestern thing, but something that I'm more interested in is having that discussion and that commitment about how we're going to communicate, right? I'm sure, you've, I'm, I'm sure you've got a good product because it's obviously good enough. You've hired sales staff and you found me, right? So you've done a little bit of research, you found me, but don't hit me over the head with it. Let's actually talk about how do you want to engage. Most importantly, CISOs are probably in their jobs longer than the sales rep are, right? Sales reps, they're building their careers themselves. They're moving up, they're moving out. And then we're setting an establishment with that company for more of a strategic relationship where we could say, oh, here's how it worked best with Susie or Phil uh, before you. 
and that makes something a little bit more sustainable. Because that's one piece we didn't really talk about here is what do you do about sustainable sales, vendor, and consumer relationships? And those tend to be my most successful ones. Even though I've been through maybe two or three generations of sales staff with a vendor, the relationship is strong and it's productive. So it's an eye towards what do we want that relationship to be and not just, hey, here's this great product, gee, don't you want it? I think there's space for that. It's a close second follow-up. But to me, the first thing is, how do we understand who we are and how we're going to communicate first? Then we'll start communicating whatever content, product, services, needs you may have. Excellent point. And a great spot to close out this discussion. This is really, really good. This is, I mean, this summarizes a lot of the stuff we've been talking about for, for the past four years. Well, we've come to the point of the conversation, and Jack, I'll have you go first, where I ask you, which quote was your favorite and why? Let me know, which one was it? I'm really going to stick with that final quote from Tiana because it captures the problem pretty well and it leaves a lot of green space for sales staff to get creative, but also depart from the bag of tricks, right? If, yes. if you're just hitting your head against a wall and you can't get through to an important vendor, change your tactic. Sending seven cold emails or seven cold LinkedIn the same way, that repetition is not going to help, right? But changing tactics and figuring out a warmer way of getting there or an indirect way of getting there, a direct way to leave earlier quote is important, but that trial and error is critical. But I also respect it a little bit more when somebody's talking to me, if they're switching up their tactics, okay, there's a mind at work behind that screen, behind that keyboard. They really are trying to communicate with me. They're just not spamming me. Jeff, your favorite quote? Boy, I, I'm i struggling here. There's about three here I think are really important. But if I, if I really break it down, I'm going to go with Thomas Fries from, from QBS Research, where he says, I would assert that how to best follow up on a cold call completely misses the point. Most of the challenge for sellers today is creating compelling reasons for the potential buyers to want to engage with you the first time rather than racking your brain to figure out how to recover from ineffective outreach. I do think that there's two elements here that I think are really important to highlight. One, and I'll just say it, your target of your email does not owe you a response, right? We're, we're busy yeah, people. That's, by the way, that came up in the first segment. That's really key. We are not required to give you a response. Yeah, and, and I know it's really tough. Look, 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 we're busy people. You're busy people. You have a hard job. It is really helpful for you as a salesperson to get a response to know whether your email landed or not. But I think that in this day and age, it's like if you don't get a response, it didn't land. Or frankly, I think what's worse is like we probably didn't get read and you just have to move on. But the reality is, and I think Neil Saltman and Ben Griffith talked about this a little bit, warm intros are the best way to go. And if it's not a warm intro or a handoff from another CISO, I, I encourage business development teams to like look for opportunities to make connections with people that are not just a cold email. And let the email be the be the follow-up to that interaction. And I think we as the security industry owe our sales partners and our partners in the, on the vendor side, which by the way, are not our enemies, I think Jack said this earlier, a lot of my success that I've had over the, my career in security has been by partnering strongly with really key vendors. And I think we have to find more ways to build that in a time when there are more vendors than ever, and there's more need for attention from those vendors than ever. We have to help build that. And I think that's on us to figure out as much as it is on the sales people. Excellent point. We, we did a super size episode for today, but I all saw it all the way around. Jack, I'm going to let you have the final word. The question I always ask all our guests is, are you hiring? So make sure you got an answer for that. I want to thank our sponsor, Soul Cyber. Remember, they are S-O-L-C-Y-B-E-R.com. Bring simplicity and affordability to your cybersecurity. Check them out. We greatly appreciate their sponsoring this episode. Jeff, I know you're always hiring. He's always looking for fantastic, talented people. And if for some demented reason you wouldn't want to work for Jeff, First, please go to see some professional help. See what's wrong with you, because it's definitely not you, Jeff. Right? Uh, there's plenty wrong with me, but uh, <laughs> but if there's if we're not uh, if we're not hiring or not hiring something that you're great at, I'm sure you can find something on LinkedIn that does meet with your delight. All right, Jack. Any final thoughts on the topic? And are you hiring? By the way. Yep, we are hiring. We've been building this program for about seven years and we've never been fully staffed. We inch up on it and then more needs arise. <laughs> it's a great place to be. Lots of flexible work accommodation, remote work, all that great stuff. And our football team's a lot better than Jeff's. So, you know, if you had to choose, oh, go, with, uh, go with the football team. <laughs> Who's my football team? 
exactly. With LinkedIn as a football team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go Bills. That's all I have to say. It's our year. All right. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you very much to your audience. And uh, hey, let me give a tip of the hat. He's 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 listening to us right now. Aaron Diaz, he's one of our producers, and he is actually heavily responsible for helping me put together the rundown for all these episodes. So if you like the way that all these quotes come together and you're quoting, you appreciate it, you can thank me, but really thank Aaron as well. A, yeah, a tip of the hat to Aaron and Andrew and all of our production staff. Oh, yeah. That, we got, man, they, they really make us sound good. Aces all the way around. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for contributing and listening to Defense In Depth. We've reached the end of Defense In Depth. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss yet another hot topic in cybersecurity. This show thrives on your contributions. Please write a review, leave a comment on LinkedIn, or on our site, CISOseries.com, where you'll also see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or a comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at david at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to Defense In Depth.